Okay. So the Rebbe's charge to us for Chinuch in our time. That's a big topic, a really big topic. Fortunately, the Rebbe organized it for us. The Rebbe gave us talking points. So what I'd like to speak with you about for the next 44 minutes or so, that's how much time they told me that I have, are the 12 psukim. The 12 psukim and Maimore Chazal verses and sayings of the sages and how they outline for us the big ideas with which to raise the generation that will bring Mashiach. So let's start with a little bit of background. The 12 Sukkim were launched in the midst of Mivtza Chinuch, the launch of the education campaign. And the first six of the 12 Sukkim were rolled out on the Rosh Chedesh Iyer Tavshin Lamed Vav. The point of Mivtza Chinuch, as the Rebbe spoke about many times throughout that Tukufa, is not contrary to popular misconception a campaign for the purpose of educating children, but rather a campaign to promote children as educators. Mivtza Chinuch is to turn our children into educators, teachers, influencers. A proactive approach. In fact, the Rebbe spoke about it at the Fabreng in that year, Yud Beis Tammuz, that apparently somebody had uh, voiced some critique that this concept was innovative. This not in a, he, he, didn't, he didn't mean innovative in a complimentary fashion. He meant that the Rebbe was uh, too radical, pushing the envelope. And at this Fabreng, the Rebbe said, I'm surprised that those who criticize this approach are showing their ignorance. Are they not aware that in a time of an educational crisis, the entirety of Torah was revived through the efforts of one sage who recruited the assistance of little children and turned them into teachers. How great is the act of Reb Chia. He took a child to learn Breshis, a child to learn Shmois, a child to learn Vayikra, a child to learn Bamidbar, a child to learn Dvorim. Five children, each one to specialize on another Chumash. And then, with the Shisha Sidra Mishnah, one child to specialize in each Seder of Mishnah. And says the Rebbe, what do we learn from this? You might think that when a child reaches an educational milestone, for instance, he finishes the study of Sefer Bereshis, that the next order on the agenda is for that child to study Sefer Shmois. Says the Rebbe, no, not at all. As soon as a child finishes and masters Sefer Bereshis, the child immediately becomes the teacher and passes on Sefer Bereshis to the next child. In other words, if you know Aleph, teach Aleph. As soon as you have what to give away, start giving it away. So Mivtza Chinuch was all about how to make children into educators. And the Yud Beis Psukim are the ammunition for children to educate each other. The Rebbe describes there the vision of, of uh, the Rebbe, first of all, he describes the, the nature of children. Children like to tell each other what to do. Children like to wield authority. And we're giving them a healthy outlet how to do that. And the Rebbe describes their scene of little children playing together. And that one of them will mention to the others one of the 12 psukim. But the way that Rebbe describes it, the Rebbe doesn't describe the 12 psukim as slogans. 
The verbiage is not important. In fact, the Rebbe said something surprising. At least it was surprising to me when I went back and I started to look at the Fabrengens. The Rebbe said, deep psukim, odra andra psukim, mekinon kleiben andra psukim, abize zol hoben dieselben inhalt. You could pick other psukim as long as they should have the same content. They should mean the same message. In other words, the Rebbe was saying, it's not the words, it's not the the actual uh, nusach, it's the ideas. These are 12 ideas. And then the Rebbe ex expounded and said, these are ideas that were chosen specifically for what purpose? I mean, you might ask, well, 12 psukim, they must be big ideas, but big idea is a relative term. What does it mean? These are the most important ideas. These are the most fundamental ideas. So the Rebbe explained, these are ideas that every child can understand and give over that these are the ideas that were chosen because every child can understand them and then give them over. So what the Rebbe was describing, the Rebbe's vision was that children would have these 12 ideas that they could own and master and give over to each other. It's interesting because in actuality what the Rebbe got was Amiras Psokim Balpeh, which obviously has a great holiness to it and a great value to it, as we see from the fact that Rebbe himself participated in saying the, the Psukim Baal Peh. But that's not what the Rebbe described when he launched the 12 Psukim. The idea was I, that, that, that these are messages, the, these are themes, these are ideas, and the words are not even all that important. In fact, I can tell you, the, the Pasuk... Uh, Behold, the Rebbe didn't even say that Pasuk in the first Fabrengen. The Rebbe said an Inyan von Yitzias Mitzrayim. So they were all Inyanim. They were concepts. It wasn't supposed to be that we, got, we get so locked into the words. I think that just in general is incredibly instructive. I, I haven't even gotten to the first Pasuk yet. But the idea that... It's not just memorization, it's not just information. It's mastery. It's learning how to think. Not being told what to think. Being taught how to think. Okay, so these 12 psukim and Maimori Chazal teach us how to think, and they mold our worldview, and they turn us into educators. Let's go through them as quickly as possible, one at a time, and in order. And the order, as you'll see, makes a lot of sense. What's the first Pasuk? Teiret Sivolana. Okay, so why is Teiret Sivolana the first Pasuk? Simple explanation is because our sages have said that as soon as a child is able to speak, they, they, they should be taught Teiret Sivolana. But what's the idea behind Teiret Sivolana? Why is this the opening? You ever had somebody disqualify themselves from your message before you even started talking? They've already excused themselves. You're not, you're not talking to me. Why are you talking to me? You got the wrong guy. I'm the wrong. You're selling to the wrong customer. I'm not orthodox. The one time there was a preacher. He got up Sunday morning and he was giving a fire and brimstone sermon. And he said, don't you know, every member of this congregation is going to die. And there was a guy in the front row who was laughing. He says, every member of this congregation is going to go before God and be judged. And there was the same guy who was laughing. The preacher said, every member of this congregation is going to suffer the flames of hell. The front guy in the front row is laughing. So the preacher says, what are you laughing about? The guy says, I'm not a member of this congregation. <laughs> okay, so before you even started speaking, uh, you're not talking to me. So the first thing we got to establish is, why am I talking to you? Before I even tell you what I want to tell you, I have to tell you why I'm talking to you. Why am I, why am I telling it to you? So the first thing you have to know is, Teiretsiva Lono. You were born into this. This is an inheritance. 
It's not something that you worked for. It's not even a gift. It's something automatically that was bequeathed to you. Even a one-day-old child is an equal owner in Torah. This is your birthright. That's why I'm talking to you. In other words, we're establishing relevancy. I think, by the way, when we stop people in the street, I'm and we say, excuse me, are you Jewish? That that's related to this idea. That even if we don't get any further than the excuse me, are you Jewish, we've established something. I've established why I'm talking to you. Who you are. Why my message is for you. Now once I've established that, you know why I'm talking to you. You're going to counter, or you could counter. And you could say, fine, I accept it, fine. I'm Jewish, I'm just as Jewish as you. The Torah belongs to me, it's mine to do with, whatever I can do. That's a beautiful idea, it's a beautiful concept. So we say to him next, no, it's not a concept. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echod. Echod means oneness, it means totality, it means everythingness. Especially as it's brought out in the Ches and in the Dalet. The Aleph is the oneness, but it's not just oneness in some philosophical sense. It's the Ches, the eight, which is the seven firmaments and the earth. And then it's the four, which is the four directions. In other words, this is not just a theory, this is practice. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echod means this is real. They tell the story about the Mashpia in Teim Chetimimim, Reb Machol der Alter. He used to daven ba'aveda. And one time, he was in the middle of Birkas Shema, where you can't be mafsik. And there was a, a cobbler, a shuster, came into the shul. And Reb Machol started gesticulating to the shoemaker. Mm, uh, 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 mm, 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 mm. And he pointed out there was a bacher whose shoes were torn up and needed to be repaired. So afterwards, some of the Talmudim asked, Reb Machol, you were in the middle of Birkas Krishma and you're gesticulating about shoes. And he says that's exactly where one's mind should be as one is about to say Shema. You think that Hashem Echod, that Hashem's oneness, means that it's up there? That it's in some ether? Hashem Echod means that if Abacha's shoes are torn up, we've got to take care of it. Hashem Echod means this isn't just theory, this is reality. So that's, that's the next step. It can't be abstract, we've got to make it concrete. Okay, so then the person says, fine. I got it. It's not just in theory, it's in practice. But I got to tell you something. My situation is different. My situation is different. I'm limited. Jonathan Sachs talks about when he first met the Rebbe, when he had the, the grant to go around America and visit uh, leaders, Jewish leaders. And he took a bus from LA to New York. And he came to the Yechidus and he interviewed the Rebbe. And then he said, after he interviewed the Rebbe, the Rebbe flipped it and started interviewing him. And the Rebbe started asking him, you know, what's going on <clears throat> at Cambridge? And how many Jews are there? And what are you doing? And what's the level of Jewish life? And, and he was shocked. He was floored because he didn't expect to be interrogated about this. So he, he tried to, he tried to, you know, uh, squee, uh, squirm out of it. So he says, um, the way he, d he described it, he spoke about it at the Kinnis a few years ago, he says that the English have a knack for constructing the most complex excuses for why they're not doing whatever. So he says, in the situation in which I currently find myself, and he says, and then the Rebbe did something which I think was quite uncharacteristic for him. He cut me off mid-sentence, and he said, you do not find yourself in a situation, you create your situation. The whole doy vadoy. You have to know like this. There are no limits. Your situation does not define you. You can do it, and there's nothing stopping you. Okay, fine, no problem. Nothing stopping me. But I don't even know how to do it. I've never done this. I have no experience. You know the paradox. You can't get a job without experience, but you can't get experience without a job. How do you even get started? So let me tell you something. 
You don't have to get started. You already started. Kol Yisrael Yeshlem Chelek Leilam Haba. Every year there's a Ben Elam Haba. You're already doing it. You don't even know that you're doing it. You know, the old marshal, Meshpiyam used to tell about the, uh, the farmer in Siberia, the peasant, who did well in business, and he became rich in spite of himself. And uh, he had a business deal in the big city. So he found out that the only way to get to this big city is to take a train. He'd never even seen a train. But he took a horse and wagon to the closest town where they had a train station. And he arrived there, and he bought a ticket for the train. And uh, he puts his money out on the counter, and he has no idea how much money it is. And what he doesn't realize is he's, he's paying enough to buy a first-class ticket. So he buys the first-class ticket, and he waits, and he waits, and finally he sees people, a few guys, jumping quickly onto the train, and they run to the back car, and they hide under the seats. So he sees that's what you do, and he imitates them, and he runs to the back car of the train, and he hides under the seat. And uh, he falls asleep. And then after a while, he feels somebody's kicking his feet, and he looks up, and it's the conductor. And the conductor says, how dare you get on this train without a ticket? He says, what do you mean, without a ticket? I have a ticket. He says, that's what, that's what they all say. Of course you have a ticket. That's why you're stowing away. He says, no, I have a ticket. Let me see your ticket. So what he had done is he didn't want anyone to steal his ticket. He was told it's very valuable, so he tied it around his body with a string. So he had to take off all of his furs and all of his coats. And then finally he pulls out the ticket and he shows it to the conductor. The conductor says, I don't understand you. You, you, you have a first-class ticket and you're hiding under a seat. What's the idea here? You are already doing this. You're already in the game. It's a Misa about a Rebbe, but you know, the Rebbe always took stories of the Nasim and said, Herol Rabim. One time the Fidik Rebbe was traveling in, in first class and somebody asked him, another Yid, not a, not a Chos, he said, Labavitch Rebbe, your fort. In, in, erst, in erst Klasse, you, you, you travel in the you know, expensive first class. And uh, the Friedrich Rebbe says, Ich bin geboren geworden in Klasse. I was born in the first class. But really, that's, that's every yid. That's every yid. So you're already in the game. You're already doing it. Kol Yisrael. Okay, fine. No problem. Kol Yisrael. Exactly. Every Jew can do this. Any Jew can do this. And therefore, let them all do it. Why me? Why are you picking on me? So then we come to Vihine. Vihine is, no, it's got to be you. I saw a video. I think it's from this year. It looks like a new video that there was a, uh, a panel of uh, world leaders. And uh, Putin's on the panel. And he told a joke. <laughs> Putin told a joke about an Israeli soldier. He says, there was an Israeli soldier and his uh, commander asks him, says, what would you do if 20, 20 terrorists are running at you? So he says, I would take out my Uzi and start spraying. The commander says, okay, good. What would you do if there's a tank coming at you? He says, then I take out my rocket launcher and I shoot. He says, good. Well, what would you do if there's 20 terrorists, a tank, and a helicopter coming at you? The soldier says, Commander, is there anyone else in this army besides for me? Vihine Hashem Nitzavolov is like this. The Rebbe explains Nitzavolov doesn't mean looming over you ominously. Nitzavolov means he's standing over you. You are standing him up. You are propping him up. You're giving support to Hashem. Yes, he fills the whole world with his glory. But he is staring at you. He's looking right at you. And he says, I need your avayda. So take it personally. It's also al derech. Another way to say this is how the Baal Shem Tov the Baal Shem Tov revealed the preciousness of the Jewish people by explaining that every single Jewish person is like an only child born to his parents in their old age. So it's not just a description of the preciousness. Yes, it's the preciousness, but it's also um, 
the, the, the responsibility. Bishvili nivro oilam, in the radical sense. Don't look next to you, don't look to your left, don't look to your right. It's you, it's all about you. The infinite is waiting on you. One of my favorite stories, I can't tell it at length or then we won't finish all the psukim, but my, one of my favorite stories, the story my friend the Rami Berkowitz told me when he was on Merkish in Alaska, and the last day of the summer, they find this little girl. They didn't even know they were finding her. They found her mother. She was the only Jewish woman they knew about. Who, she was a public school teacher, and then they found out she had married an Eskimo, and she had a little five-year-old daughter who was there in the school, and so, so then they met the five-year-old daughter because her mother's Jewish, so, she, so she's Jewish, so now they found out there's a second Jew in the town, and Rami has two minutes with this girl, and this is the message, this, is ha you know, this has to be like the thing that she's gonna hear and associate with Judaism for the rest of her life. And so he just, he's carrying the neshek with him, and he takes it out and he just, he says, I, uh, I just started speaking and I said, you know, the Rebbe, you gotta find the words. And so I said to the girl, he said, you know what these are? Candles, you know what they're for. No, okay, every Friday afternoon before sunset, Jewish women and girls all over the entire world, they light Shabbos candles. And the first place where the sun sets in the whole world is Australia. And if you look at the whole world, you see these little dots of light, just a few dots of light. There's Sydney, there's Melbourne, and they start lighting up. And then the sun sets, keeps moving further and further, and then there's like this big, huge light, Eretz Yisrael, millions of these lights, Jewish women and girls lighting Shabbos candles. And then the sun sets over Europe, and then you see some lights here and there. Oh, then there, there's Paris, there's London. And then it comes over the Atlantic. You get another big, huge light. There's New York. Then you get Chicago, then you get LA. He says, you know the last place in the whole world, the furthest west place where there's a little Jewish girl to light Shabbos candles is right here, you. You're the last Jewish girl in the whole world, the last place where the sun sets every Friday afternoon. And Hashem watches and he waits for that last light to show up. That's you. By the way, how often do we make sure that our kids, I'm talking about our kids, who grow up in the system, know that they are unique and that they're not a number, that they're a name, and they have individuality and they're indispensable I know we have rules, and we have a system, and we have a dress code, and we have all these things that, and I'm not against any of it, but we have all these reminders in place of conformity, and, and, and it's necessary. You know, there's Nitzavim and there's Vayelech. Nitzavim is standing firm. Vayelech is gegangen. There has to be fluidity. So just this message of your individuality, your indispensable contribution, that it is as if Hashem is focused completely on you. Okay. Finally, the person says like this. Okay, fine, no problem. Um, it has to be me. But realistically, it's too hard. No, 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 I know already I can do it because you told me that already. You told me there are no limitations. There's no Mitzrayim. You know, that's a yecholos. You know, there's the koyach and there's the yecholos. There's a yecholos. Okay, I can do it in theory. Nothing's stopping me. But then the koyach, I, I don't have the ability to do it. I don't have the power. I don't have the wherewithal. It's too hard for me. So this we tell him. You've got it. It's in you. You don't even have to reach out your hand to get it. It's in you already. You know the story about the young man, Elliot Lasky. He grew up in Buffalo. His parents, he was born in a DP camp in Germany after the war. His parents were Holocaust survivors. So he grew up in a house of sort of the old world style. He spoke a little Yiddish. But he uh, drifted off. And then he ended up touring with the Rolling Stones. And then he started uh, getting curious in spirituality. Not Judaism at first, but Buddhism. But then he, th he thought, maybe I'll look and I'll see what Yiddishkeit has to offer. He started talking to Rabbi Gerari in Buffalo. And finally, his questions were of such a philosophical nature. Rabbi Gerari told him, you got go to go to the Rebbe. So the whole story happened on a bitter cold day in January 1967. He's standing in front of 770. 
And uh, when the Rebbe comes out of 770, the Ilum there, they see how this guy in a leather jacket, cowboy boots, jeans, long hair, makes a beeline right up to the Rebbe. And they see the Rebbe is engaged. The Rebbe is looking at him, and he's looking at the Rebbe, and there's this conversation going on, and nobody can get close enough to hear. And they just see the Rebbe go like this. And then they see this, this young guy with the long hair. He repeats himself. And then the Rebbe goes like this. Again, the Rebbe repeats the, the, the motion. And then they see this young guy. He, he, he says again. He, he says something else. And finally, the Rebbe places his holy finger on this young man's chest right above his heart. And the man breaks down weeping. For 35 years, nobody knew what the Rebbe told him. Just lately, because of the my encounters, because of Jem, he, he talked about his experience. He says, basically, his big philosophical question was, where is God? And he, he said it to the Rebbe in Yiddish. He knew Yiddish from his upbringing. He said, who is God? And he said, the Rebbe said to him, Umatum, in a stein, in a boim, Umatum, in Alts. God is everywhere, in a stone, in a tree, all around. And I said, Ich weiß, aber wo, wo is God? And the Rebbe said, in Alts, Umatum, in everything, all around. And I said, Ich weiß, aber wo? And the Rebbe said to him, I das is wie du fragst. God is da in dein hearts. Ki korvelach adava ma'id means you don't have to go out and get it. You don't even have to reach out your hand. It is in you. You have it. That which you are searching for is within you. Now we've finished the first six psukim. And we know that we are unstoppable. That we have the mission. We have the charge. And we have the ability and the wherewithal to carry it out. We are ready to go. Why are there another six psukim? How am I doing on time, by the way? What's the time? How much more time do I have? Hmm? Anyone want to tell me honestly? Nobody will tell me? 15 minutes. Okay. We got to speed up. The first six psukim are all messages about self-concept, about how to view myself. The second six psukim are all about how to view the world. And now I have a new set of excuses. Okay, I can do it. But the world will not be receptive to it. It won't actually change <clears throat> the world. It won't actually have an effect. I'll do it. I'll do it. And maybe I'll even earn schar. It'll be good for me. But let's not pretend that we can actually change the world this way. So we come to the second group of six psukim. The Rebbe revealed the first six psukim, Reish Chedish, Iyer, and then 18 days later at the Lag Beimer rally, the Rebbe revealed the second set of six psukim. Second six psukim begin with Breishis. First rule you need to know is the world was made for this. Breishis bora leki mesi shamai vesa The world has a divine design. And everything in the world is made for this purpose. You are not going to find resistance in the world. To the contrary, you will find the world is working with you because that's what it was made for. You know uh, how the Rebbe's approach, for instance, to technology was different than the rest of the Haredi world. If it exists in the world, it cannot be an obstacle. It's not here to fight us. It exists in the world for us to use it. It's part of the mission.
The world was created for this. The next thing you got to know, Vishinantam Levonecha. Now, Vishinantam Levonecha is, is at first blush, is a funny pasuk, because Vishinantam Levonecha is speaking to parents. You should, you should teach your children. But remember what I said earlier, that the 12 sukkim and the whole Mivtza Chinuch is not really for the purpose of educating children, but for turning children into educators. So even Vishinantam Levanecha is not talking about children being taught so much as it is talking to the child about how to be a teacher, how to be an influencer. Vishinantam Levanecha means like this. There's no time there is no point in your day or your life where this Aveda is not number one on the agenda. See, it's sort of like this. There's place and there's time. There's Mokim and there's Man. So Shema Yisra, so, so Bereish is Bara Lekim, is Shema Yvesa Oretz, Pasuk 7, is talking about place. There's no place where we cannot, there's no place that will not work with us. Vishinantam Levanecha is how it spans through time. There's no time that will also not be conducive to this task. And, 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 and not only just on a, you know, Vishinantam Levanecha can describe a person's day, getting up, going to sleep. It could also talk about the generations, you know, the whole timeline of history. Vishinantam Levanecha means intergenerational. The point is, there's no time that is not relevant. Or, you know, when the Alter Rebbe was in prison, one of the questions that he asked the minister who, was, uh, who came to ask him biblical questions, remember he asked him the famous question, why did Hashem ask Adam Rishon Ayaka? And, and the Alter Rebbe asked him first. He said, before I answer, I want to know, do you believe that the Torah is applicable in every place and at every time? And the non-Jewish minister said, yes, I do believe that. And the Alter Rebbe was relieved because that was one of the tenets of Tera Sabal Shem Tov, And he understood that he was there in defense of Tera Sabal Shem Tov. And after this non-Jewish minister says, yes, I believe that the, the Torah is applicable in every place and every time. Then he told them, the Perush of Ayaka, that it's personal, that Hashem is speaking to you. So there's no place and there's no time that is not conducive to this mission. Okay, now I have another excuse. I got it, fine. No place and no time. But here's the problem. Realistically, the problem is so big, it will take an infinity in order to remedy it. It's just, and, and I have proof for you. My proof is I go out and I do good things and I don't see a change. I don't see an effect. So now we're told, Yigaiti timing. Why does he say timing? Loshin amuna. What's the amuna part here? What's the faith part? The faith part is like this. If I toil and I see cause and effect, I don't need any amuna. Amuna is I toiled and I didn't see the effect. You must believe that there's no such thing as an effort in vain. Right, like uh, the Rebbe said many times, that chazaka, that it is established. She'ein tamula chayzeres reikom, that there's no such thing as an effort in vain. That every ounce of effort has peros, has fruits. But you need a muna. Remember the Rebbe told the story about the bacha merkeshlechus. Her, who, who, who turned out to be uh, Rabbi Krinsky, the story about the Bostonian, that he didn't even know the impression that he made on this fellow. He didn't know, but he had an effect. And how many times, you know, you go on Miftoyim, and you ask somebody, do you, want, do, you want to, do you want to accept Shabbos candles? And they say no in the most emphatic way. You don't get to hear the end of the story that 254 people had to ask this woman, if she wants Shabbos candles, and you were number 153, and you were just part of the process to warm it up, and you don't realize that one day, 
You know, like the Rebbe said one time about how Rebbe Akiva's life was changed by the drips of the stone on the rock. So let's say it took millions of drips of water on the rock. What about all those drips that came before that last one that, that, that was the tipping point, that actually penetrated? You couldn't elim eliminate one single drip that came before even though that wasn't the drip that actually broke the stone. But you have to have a muna. You have to know that your effort doesn't go into a void. Your effort goes straight into the system and has its effect. And just be patient and you'll see. Okay, what's the next excuse? Fine, no problem. But here's, here's my objection at this point. People don't like it. They don't like it. I, I understand. You're saying, if I'll pester a guy enough, eventually he'll put on tefillin. They don't want it. I asked him. He told me to go away. So he say, listen to me. Do you have any avas yisrael? The stuff that you've already agreed is good for you. you got to agree that it's good for him. You have to like, kamaycha. We've already come to a point where you're doing all this. Share the wealth. Well, like the, the Baal Shem Tov said, Im harbe Simple pshat is, if you learned a lot of Torah, don't think so highly of yourself. The Baal Shem Tov said, Im harbe. If you learned a lot of Torah, don't hold on to a good thing. Just for yourself. Spread it around. And by the way, it's interesting. We have to look as a posuk. But here we don't use it as a posik, we use it as a maimer chazal. Amar Rabbi Akiva. Zaklad Godobat Why do we say that extra additional few words, Zaklad Godobat Because what we're trying to explain is this. It's not just that Avas Yisrael is another nice thing. It's a klal Godobat in other words, you can't really have everything else before and just, I'll do it, but without the Avas Yisrael part. It'll be all of Yiddishkeit, but without that, okay, you know, like you, you do all 613 mitzvahs, okay, so this will be the mitzvah that I don't do. It's a cloud gold of Torah, it's fundamental. You can't do this and not give it away. There's a story I'll tell quickly about a, a Yid who was in uh, the Sinai Desert in the Israeli Air Force. It was Purim. He didn't even know it was Purim. And he got a Sholach Monas. So Sholach Monas from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. This moved him deeply. And this started his path of tshuva. And it was eventually, like many Israelis, when they leave Eretz Yisrael and they go chutz Laaretz, they become more religious. He ended up in Chicago. And Rebbe Daniel Maskowitz, all of a shalom, brought him to Machni Yisrael. And he met the Rebbe. And the Rebbe asked him a question. How come everything in Yiddishkeit puts the emphasis on the right side? When it comes to the heart, which is such a vital organ, Hashem seemingly put it on the wrong side. He put it on the left side. Let it be like the brain that's in the center. Or if it has to be off-center, to, off to one side or the other, put it on the right. Why put it on the left? This guy couldn't answer the question. So the Rebbe said, but the whole purpose of the heart is emotions, and emotions aren't for yourself, they're for others. So when you face another Jew in Avas Yisrael, your heart is on the right, on the other Jew's right. So his whole awakening to Yiddishkeit was when he was a receiver, he got a gift. The Rebbe flipped it, now you gotta become a giver. Now you have to give the gift. Not just because, you know, one good turn deserves another, and now, now it's, you know, now you gotta step up, but because, that's how you were designed. You were made. Your heart was placed on the other guy's right side. When are we healthy? When are we functioning according to our design? When we're giving. So don't give me this business that I'll do everything else but the Avas Yisrael part. The whole purpose of it is to share it with somebody else. Or perhaps you could say it like this. And I think everyone here knows this, and I think it's something we try to teach our children, 
And I hope it's something we try to teach every Jew that we meet. That when it comes down to it, the only Yiddishkeit that you really have is whatever Yiddishkeit you are actively giving away. That's what you have. Okay, so Avas Yisrael is a klal gol Fine, no problem. It's a klal gol It's very, very important. We're getting to the home stretch now. Vizet. No, it's not very important. It's not just really important. It's not just majorly important, incredibly important. No, Vizet, this is what it's all about. Tachles briyose. This is what the whole th this is why you were created. This is why the world was created. It's about one thing. It comes down to one thing. There's a story. I won't say what yeshiva it was, but Reb Chaim Gutnik stopped by one of the non-Hasidic yeshivas. And then later on, he was in 770. And uh, he happened to mention that the yeshiva show world had two questions. I don't know if he said tainas or questions, but about Chabad and about the Reb. One question was, how come they take one little medrash and turn it into a whole tzimis. They, they, they make that a whole yesod for the whole Yiddishkeit. And by one little medrash, what did he mean? Medrash tanchoma, parshas nasei, nesavel yeslei dira betachtenim. One little medrash. And you know, of course, the, the Rebbe Rishab and Samach Vav goes through all the different reasons through rabbinic literature about why the Abish created the world, Tevatev Lahetiv, Begindish de Maiden Lay, and all the, the different Enkech Chosar Poyal, and all the different. But basically, the, the Rabbi Shab concludes that this Medish Tanchuma, Dirab Tachtainim, is the only one that really explains the whole Ishtalshlis, right? Okay. So, Rabbi Chaim Gutnik says so they were asking one question is how come the Rebbe, especially, you know, not just Chesidis Chabad, but especially in Der Shvi, Bosilagani, the whole Ikashrina Betachtainim, is all built on this one little madrash, one obscure source. And then the other question was, how come when the Rebbe comes out with new initiatives and new programs, he doesn't consult with the other G'daylim? So the Rebbe smiled and he said that the first question already answers the second question. How can we discuss how to accomplish the goal when we don't even agree on the goal? This isn't one little medrash. It's not an obscure, far-flung source, a quaint idea. This, this is what it's all about. This is what we're all here for, nothing less. Okay, fine, you got me? Sign me up. I'll do it. No, 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 no. You can't just do it. You got to be happy about it. Oh, now this also, I got to be happy about it. Yismach, yes, be happy about it. It's a story. Joe Felig came to do, uh, the Rebbe for uh, Tishrei. And at the end of Tishrei, he decided, he was a young businessman, he had some money, not a lot of money, but he knew he was supposed to leave a check. So he went to Maskiris to leave a check. And he thought to himself, he says, look, I'm not from Chesidim. No, yeah. It's a whole long story, but after the war, basically, uh, Lubavitch was the only one who took in the Felix, so that's how he ended up in Lubavitch. So he says, look, I'm not a Chosid, or I'm not from Chassidim, or Shtam from Chassidim. I don't know exactly how it's done, but I know what they say, that if the Rebbe is the Rebbe, the way they say, then he knows my neshama, and he knows exactly how much dukkah I have to give. So that's it, I'm leaving a blank check by Mesquitas, let the Rebbe fill it in. So Joe Felix left the blank check, okay. He doesn't hear anything for a week for a month, for two months. It's the middle of Hanukkah. The phone rings, he answers the phone, Rabbi Chadukov is on the phone. The Rebbe would like to know if it will be all right to fill in the check for $10,000. Now, I think this was 1967. That, that would be like a half a million dollars today. And he wasn't that wealthy at that point. He was a young guy, he did not have that much money. <laughs> that was the whole plan. He's signing the blank check. The Rebbe says, would it be enough? $10,000, is that okay? So basically, he said, yes, and he hung up. So he couldn't take it back. And the second he hung up, he starts thinking, 
how long does it take for the funds in America to clear in Canada? How much time, basically, do I have to beg or borrow or do whatever I got to do to get money in that account so the check won't bounce? And he's thinking, where can he get money? What can he, what can he sell? What can he liquidate? What can he borrow? And he's, you know, it's, it's very stressful. And, and he's getting stressed now. How is he going to even cover it? And the phone rings again. Hello, Rabbi Kharukov again. He says, the Rebbe would like to know if you are doing this b'simcha u b'tuv levav. <laughs> it's not enough that I'm doing it, right? B'simcha u b'tuv levav. This also it has to be. So he stopped and he thought to himself, I left by the Rebbe a blank check because I knew that the Rebbe knows what my neshama came here to this world to do. And I got my answer. I got what... How much greater a gift can anybody receive than being told exactly what your soul came to this world to achieve? And then he said to Rabbi Chadokov, yes, yes, b'sim chubatuv leivav, of course, with a full glad heart. Yismach Yisrael. Enjoy it. Who wouldn't be thrilled to know not only that your life has meaning, but exactly how to live it out every minute. The gift that Rebbe gives us is that we know every moment how to use, not that we always do, but we know how to use out every moment in a way that is directly cause and effect linked to the entire purpose of the entire creation. And if you think about that, how could you not be happy? Anyways, these are 12 big ideas that the Rebbe said, not only we can say to children, but children can internalize and say to each other. So we have our work cut out for us. Thank you.